Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Kip Hale, um, Senior Counsel for the ABA Center for Human Rights here in Washington, D.C., and Director of the ABA International Criminal Court Project. On behalf of the sponsors, we thank you for coming to our event today entitled International Criminal Justice, Mass Atrocities, the International Criminal Court, and the Role of States. Our sponsors, the American Bar Association International Criminal Court Project, the Aspen Institute Justice and Society Program, and the Coalition for the International Criminal Court welcome you, and thank you to the panelists for your gracious participation today in what should be a very edifying conversation. We would like to give special thanks to the Royal Kingdom of the Netherlands for their gracious and generous uh, support of this event today. Of course, we would thank Jones Day for hosting this and this beautiful view. Unfortunately, with the sun, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, we, we won't have the panorama. But I, I personally thank Jones Day because this will be probably the closest I ever get to giving the State of the Union address. <laughs> And I would also like to point out today, when we look at our composition of our panelists, we have current or former prosecutors to four different international tribunals, only one judge, and no experienced international criminal defense lawyers. So if anyone has any plans to commit any sorts of crime, I assure you a quick investigation, trial, sentence, and conviction and sentence. Finally, as a, a point of order, um, as you can see, um, Bill Pace, um, the commuter of the Coalition of International Criminal Court, is not here today to moderate. He fell ill. He sends his uh, apologies for doing so, and we wish him a speedy recovery. But uh, Stephen Maloney, the senior advisor to the Coalition of International Criminal Court, has uh, gracefully uh, stepped in at the last moment, so we thank you, Stephen. Additionally, also one point of order, uh, Madam Prosecutor will be leaving uh, during the mi middle of this panel uh, for a meeting, but coming right back. Um, as a sponsoring entity, if I would your indulgence, uh, one moment to discuss the ABICC project, which you have your pamphlets here, so I won't go into a uh, lot of detail. Um, but uh, for the record, as, as many of you know, the ABA has been um, supportive of the concept of the International Criminal Court and, of course, the current International Criminal Court since 1978. Most recently, um, in addition to urging the U.S. government to ratify, uh, we've urged the U.S. government to find a greater support for the International Criminal Court. The ABICC project is an implementation of those policies. And we do so through two primary methods, um, advocacy and education, like this great event today. Um, another example is this morning we had a congressional briefing with a Madam Prosecutor with around 40 uh, congressional staffers that went quite well. Um, so those are the types of activities we do. Additionally, I'll make note that our website is not live, so please do not <laughs> go to it right now. But in a month, please do. And our website is uh, a big part of our educational campaign. Um, in addition to talking about the news and events, um, there will be interactive and innovative uh, content on there discussing what the International Criminal Court is, its jurisdiction, its mandate, in the U.S. ICC relations. We have teamed up with Stanford Law School to do an online periodical on the website called the International Criminal Justice Today. This, uh, excuse me, this uh, online periodical will not only have um, daily news about the International Criminal Court and uh, polling data actually on the International Criminal Court uh, as it's received here in the United States done by ISOS market uh, research data. But additionally, we have Agranda, which is a, a monthly roundtable of experts discussing pressing international criminal, uh, criminal justice issues. We also teamed up with the University of Arizona College of Law to do the proven practices of international criminal justice. These will be capturing and codifying the proven practice. It will be a great resource for not only tribunal practitioners, but national practitioners uh, undertaking complementary proceedings. Lastly, another part of the ABICC project is uh, practical legal support. Where appropriate and requested, we work with our international organizational partners to do certain types of legal support in the International Criminal Court and national jurisdictions, doing this uh, complementary proceedings as well. And then finally, I make note of our distinguished board of advisors, uh, many of whom are here uh, in this office. Excuse me, here today is just Judge Walden. Hans Corral 
and others. Um, this bipartisan multinational board um, embodies the ABICC project, which is that the International Criminal Court and International Criminal Justice is, is a political issue. Um, it's something to, to the interest of us all. So without further ado, I will uh, thank again everyone for coming. Um, after the first panel, um, Meryl Sherdoff, who is with Aspen Institute, um, will be uh, giving you an introduction to the next panel. But without further ado, I, I turn it over to Stephen Lumani. Thank you, Kip. Uh, and thank you, everyone, uh, for turning up this afternoon for the discussions. On behalf of Bill Pace, uh, my boss and the coalition's behalf, um, I would like to also thank the ABICC project, the Aspen Institute Justice and Society Program. Um, and then I would just like to introduce to you the coalition for the ICC briefly, because I realize that uh, in Washington, D.C. here, you might not know a lot about the coalition for the ICC. The coalition for the ICC was created in 1995 with a number of goals. One of them was to advocate for the creation of the ICC. Secondly, to promote ratification and implementation of the ICC, which we continue to do around the world. Then provide a platform for engagement on the ICC. To date, we have a total of about 2,500 members around the world in 150 countries. Uh, and we operate in different parts of the world. This afternoon, I would like to frame this discussion in the context of the ICC-US relations uh, in criminal justice, which the US plays a very important role. And before us, we have here two distinguished guests and panelists with long experience in promoting international criminal justice. On my right, we have Honorable Justice Patricia Wald, um, who is a member of the CIC Advisory Board. Uh, she's also been a former chair of the Open Society Justice Initiative, and she's previously served as a judge of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and as a chief judge of the Courts of Appeals of the District of Columbia. Patricia will start the discussion this afternoon by focusing on the U.S. engagement with the ICC and UN tribunals. The way we'll conduct the discussions this afternoon is I'll raise some of the issues that uh, she can address um, and then after that, uh, I'll hand over to Ambassador Stephen Rudd uh, to address some of the issues with the new engagement of the US administration and, and the ICC. Um, so to get us started off, um, Honorable Judge Ward, um, could you please talk about the difference between the US ICC engagement, the UN and tribunals? And then if you could look at the following uh, subtopic specifically. Uh, on the steps that the U.S. may take to strengthen relationship with the court over the long term. Um, secondly, how the ICC can assist to the U.S. goals of atrocity prevention. Three, on lessons learned from, her, um, from your experience as a judge of ICTY and how this could strengthen the efficiency of ICC deliberations. And lastly, on the best approach of assuring just and accountability in Syria. Uh, for example, the proposal for an ad hoc tribunal. All in five minutes or less, right? Five minutes or less, <laughs> yes. or more if you can. Okay, yeah. I'll give it a shot. <clears throat> well, let me do first a very brief uh, walk through the past history of the United States and international criminal courts. Now, I say up front by way of apology, I'm neither a bona fide historian nor even a professor. So if I make mistakes, um, you, you have to be indulgent uh, because most of what I say, indeed all of what I say, will be from my perspective and my experience. And my experience has been uh, largely as an observer, but with several episodes of in and out with the international criminal courts. Both the couple of years I served as a judge on the <clears throat> Yugoslav Tribunal and also some work I've done in conjunction um, in ter terms of advice or um, other kinds of assistance uh, with the ICC but from the outside. Let me make a few point points, very brief points about history. 
one in the United States. Well, of course, you go back to, you could go back further, but let's start with the Nuremberg Tribunals, where the United States was a leading proponent of having an international criminal court, which would seek accountability of the individuals for some of the crimes, uh, the terrible crimes that had been committed uh, in the uh, wake of and preceding it uh, of World War II. And there, uh, the famous stories, which you've all heard, uh, and you've heard them so often, there must be some uh, credence to them, and that was that uh, the members of the Allies, Stalin and even Churchill, wanted to really take out the worst criminals, the ones that we actually had captured uh, at the end of World War II, and shoot them. Uh, and it was actually the United States uh, and I, I think uh, Great Britain who pushed very hard for a kind of accountability um, and Jackson's famous words, which I cannot, I don't have in front of me, but paraphrased, were, we want to make sure that they are convicted uh, in a way that we can hold up our heads in, um, in appreciation of our own principles. Uh, that the, the cup, I think he used the uh, analogy, the cup we put to our lips will not be poisoned by our having treated them without any semblance of due process, something along those lines. Anyway, um, then, then, then one jumps to the 90s, um, a long jump of some 40 years. But the United States, again, I think it's fair to say, was very much in the forefront of establishing uh, the Yugoslav Tribunal. Now, some cynics might say that that was a way, since there were not going to be troops on the ground in the horrors that were being uh, revealed of the Yugoslav Tribunal, therefore uh, this was a sort of second choice. I prefer to take a more idealistic view of that, but it certainly uh, Madeleine Albright was a great proponent of setting up the Yugoslav Tribunal and the Rwanda Tribunal, which came the next year. And I will tell you that I came on to the tribunal uh, in 99, which was six years, more or less. Um, Richard Goldstone, who was there at the very beginning, can give you his impressions if he cares to. But by the time I got there, uh, certainly the United States had its imprint on the tribunal. Uh, the United States had seconded some very, very able prosecutors. I had two trials. I sat on the trial bench over there in the Srebrenica massacre case and in one of the large prison cases, the Omarska and several other prison cases. In each case, and I just happened to be lucky, I guess, in each case I had a justice, former justice, uh, Department of Justice prosecutor, um, along with sometimes a prosecutor from, a, from another country. But it was very evident, uh, and indeed the uh, OTP over there uh, had lots, and still does have some, but had lots of U.S. people, the deputies and the registrar's office, the clerks. So there was very much, the rules of the court showed a heavy, um, a heavy bent toward uh, adversary system, which of course came out of U.S., Great Britain kind of thing, with some civil system input. Uh, over the years that's changed, and there's a lot more of the civil society impact with the rules, but in the beginning we had a great deal. So I guess my point is that uh, there, there was, there's always been a United States judge on the ICTY. First it was Gabby McDonald, who was the first president, not the first president, but the second president of the ICTY, then myself, and then Ted Meron has been on there since I left, which is way back in about 2000. So. My point is, it was a very welcoming um, sort of place for um, the U.S. influence, I think, uh, was very prominent there. Some people might have thought too much, but uh, if you were a U.S. person working there, it was very comfortable. Now, as far as the other courts went, I think we were a firm supporter of the Rwanda Tribunal. I think um, the ambassador worked as a prosecutor there, uh, and again, there was a lot of support. Other ad hoc tribunals which arose during that period. Um, the Sierra Leone Commission, which was of a different type, was 
the result of an, not a UN tribunal, but the result of an agreement between the government of Sierra Leone uh, and the international community. But the chief, first chief prosecutor was David Crane, who came from the Pentagon. Um, the Cambodian court, let's say the US, um, is certainly not opposed to it, but its cooperation has been more restrained. Um, for, for whatever reasons. Okay, that gets us up to, or actually past, uh, the ICC, which, of course, when the Rome Statute was passed in 1998, the U.S. had been involved in the Rome Conference, and it looked to a lot of people, I was not there, I don't, so that I can't speak firsthand about this, but it looked to a lot of people as though we would be a prime, um, prime in participant involved in it. I, we did a lot of work in the uh, elements, the crime elements, in uh, some of the proposed rulemaking. But in the final stages, uh, we uh, declined to go along. Now the two, again, I'm taking a second hand, but the two major objections that I recall were one, there was a dispute over the powers of the prosecutor, whether the prosecutor would be allowed to actually uh, propose uh, the, the targets or propose the cases without any kind of Security Council involvement. The other was the perennial um, concern that U.S. persons, they then talked about servicemen, but I think it was broader than that, that U.S. persons might be brought before foreign courts and uh, a court which we didn't control and what would happen to them. So in the end, President Clinton signed the um, ICC statute, but he said he was not going to send it over for ratification uh, until certain details were worked out. Then he himself left office. And there was a period of 2000 to 2005 which uh, I, as an outsider, and this is my own um, appellation, appellation would call a dark period for the ICC. The Bush administration, I think, led pretty much by John Bolton, or at least he was one of the most vocal uh, opponents of it, and said things like he hoped it would wither on the vine. Um, and the, the U.S. participated in promoting, as much as it could, so-called Article 98 bilateral immunity agreements, whereby countries would uh, agree that they would not turn over any um, persons that came under their custody to the uh, U.S. persons or people contractors with U.S. Uh, persons, turn them over to the ICC, and pretty much the notion was this is not a good thing, and it's not anything we want anything to support, and I think President Bush notified the powers that be that even though we had joined and the way the um, statute is set up, joiners have some very low-key obligations, uh, even if it isn't ratified, and that we wouldn't even go along with those. Toward the end of the Bush era, 2005 to 2008, things got uh, a little less tense. And uh, some of the, while well, we never officially uh, came away from opposing it, uh, nonetheless, uh, the, the, um, pr the representatives of the government on whom I often appeared with panels took a more, uh, certainly a less stringent view toward uh, the court. And of course, uh, we did have the Darfur vote in which the Security Council actually delegated or sent uh, to the ICC the um, question of whether or not um, Darfur and what was going on there should be, become a subject of ICC. Uh, it was interesting because the U.S. did that by way of abstaining so that it could be carried on the Security Council vote, uh, the delegation. Uh, and although, and I, being in the private sphere by this time, I happened to know, and many other people knew, there was a lot of back of the, <laughs> a lot of negotiations going on behind the scenes in which uh, if not the government, certainly uh, influential people in the United States were pushing uh, to make this. Now, <clears throat> comes 2008, 
and a new president. Uh, I, again, I'm drawing a personal history, but I was an ardent campaigner for President Obama, and I know I was on the task force. Uh, we had a task force that was looking at international uh, justice, and we were pushing very hard uh, for the whole way, as it were, ratification, but certainly if not ratification, uh, you know, a, a much more of a constructive, positive um, engagement with the ICC. Um, and we had reason to hope uh, that that would come about. Now, um, we have not seen anything uh, near ratification. I have to be honest with you, I don't think we will in the immediate future. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that there's been um, much more constructive uh, and Steve Ambassador Rapp will tell us more about that as well as uh, the OTP uh, prosecutor. I think there's been a lot more uh, cooperation with them. A couple of indicia of that uh, are just last year, I never pronounced these names right, but Bosco and Nariganda surrendered himself to the U.S. Embassy. He's one of the people who have been uh, you know, use the word indicted, it's warrant or whatever, but it's the equivalent of indicted to the U.S. Embassy in Rwanda, and the U.S. subsequently assisted in transferring him to the ICC. It was a statement in March 2010 indicating that all currently active ICC cases are in the national interest of the United States. That's one of the requirements. Uh, I think it's, it's in the Service Persons Protection Act or in one of the acts saying uh, that before we can do anything to support, it has to be that the prosecution is in the interest of the United States. The Obama administration people began participating in meetings with the court to identify the ways that the U.S. could assist in trials, and they went uh, to the um, meetings of the, of the ASP, the Association of Inter uh, Parties that is the governing body of the ICC. And of course, in February 2011, Libya was referred to the ICC by unanimous support of the Security Council. And this was the first time that the US actually participated uh, in that. Two other quick things we've done, and then I'll move to the second part of, the, uh, of your, if I can remember it, <laughs> what you asked me to talk about. Uh, one, uh, there has been created in 2011 the Atrocities Prevention Board, which is a standing interagency body which is uh, to form responses to mass atrocities and work to prevent future war crimes, crimes against humanity. I think I'm fair in saying that a person who has had a great deal of influence on that was Samantha Powers while she was still in the Security Council. She's now, of course, the UN. While I was in The Hague, uh, she was writing her first book. I remember meeting her when she came by. Uh, the book that won her the Pulitzer Prize, Genocide, the Crime from Hell. So I think this may have had a great deal, the Prevention Board may have had a great deal with, to do with her presence there. Um, and the Department of Justice and Department of Homeland Security are working in conjunction with that board to prevent those who have committed atrocities from seeking refuge in the U.S. and offered rewards for those abroad. Uh, interesting, the whole reward phenomenon, I'll go back a little bit because the two most sought after um, people uh, potential defendants of the ICTY, of course, were Karadzic and Miladzic after Milosevic himself uh, had been uh, captured and come on trial. And, but those, those, both Karadzic and Milotic were out in the general populace for Milotic, I think it was 15 years. Karadzic was less than that, but it was a great number of years. And the, there's some controversy. We, had, we did have the rewards. There were rewards that were given for information leading to how much that actually had to do with the eventual capture. But uh, in this sphere, uh, you can't afford to miss any uh, possibilities here. There's another, which leads to the other program, which is the War Crimes Rewards Program. 
which allows for the Department of State to offer rewards up to $5 million for information leading to the arrests, transfers, or convictions of mass crime fugitives. And as of January 2013, the program is being applied to those who are accused by any international tribunal, including the ICC. Um, so that's sort of where we are now. Uh, I'm going to move a little bit. My own feeling, and I'd be very interested in how other people on this panel and later on feel, is that ratification is not in the um, not in the wings or not for the immediate future. Again, my own feeling is that I think there's right now there's significant enough opposition to that kind of engagement on the Hill that it wouldn't be a very practical uh, option to throw it out there. But others might disagree with that. Again, I sense that it's not now uh, so much a worry about the prosecutor being uh, too independent and running off crazy. There were things originally like the prosecutor would go after Israel, or the prosecutor would do, uh, or the United States, or you know, do things. Uh, I think the prosecutor, we're under our second prosecutor, but certainly whatever you know, whatever one might say, uh, the prosecutors have not been um, have not misused their discretion. In fact, I think if any criticism, there is some, has come, it's perhaps that they've been too cautious in some cases, or they haven't moved fast enough. So I don't think that that's the big question out there. Um, I, what I do think is there is still res some residue, but perhaps taking on a different form of could we trust our people to be tried in these international courts. At least I detected that kind of thing in the brief contacts I've had with her people when the question is discussed. And here I move to my own, which I hope are somewhat responsive to the second parts of your questions, which go to um, you know, some of the possibilities of strengthening the ICC or anything, uh, learns, lessons learned from the prior tribunals. Um, and I would say that I think what the ICC really needs in the next several years is it's got, to, for the, in the United States particularly, uh, it's got to show or it's got to demonstrate that it is a competent court in terms of being able to prosecute and uh, fairly but efficiently. Um, now, the, the record so far, uh, and there are many good reasons for it, I'm sure a new court starting up, and everybody knows international, I knew uh, six months after I got to the Hague, international cases are a lot harder than even the most complex domestic cases that we have, considering huge numbers of people over long periods of time, uh, taking hundreds of miles, et cetera. And they become even harder in that um, it, usually the war, so far with many of the ICC prosecutions, the war is still going on. You can't even count on getting your witnesses or getting, um, let alone your perpetrators. <laughs> Um, are, are getting evidence because the, the war is still going on, diplomatic negotiations are still going on, there's just a, a, a great deal of other things that are in the mix. Uh, but still, I think regardless, there is a sense that um, the ICC after 10, 11 years now has had two trials ending in convictions, and there are five or six, whatever the number is, more in the works, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very slow process. And I think that the challenge to the ICC for the next several years is to have some reasonable number of prosecutions and, and disposals, whether they're convictions or acquittals, uh, within, I would say, a rough period. Others have suggested similar periods of the trial not going beyond a year, a year and a half, something like that, and even the investigations being a couple of years. 
uh, and that they should be relatively, at least one or two of them, be relatively high level prosecutions. Uh, now, admittedly, the, DARF, the Security Council referrals are high level prosecutions, but unfortunately, uh, one of the biggest problems the ICC has had, of course, is the inability to get the actual defendant in the dock. And um, that's happened in the Qaddafi case in Libya. It's, happen it's happening in the Darfur case, uh, in which the warrants have been outstanding for the warrant in the Darfur case for Bashir has been outstanding since 2005. So I think those are major problems uh, that have to be done. Now, I would say drawing from, you know, I think that getting speedy trials um, is, is very speedy but fair trials. Drawing from the ICTY experience and from my home domestic experience, I would say that means, you know, getting the procedures of the court kind of up and running at a little faster pace, a little more efficient pace um, than, than perhaps uh, they are doing now. And uh, I think that, and I, I say this with some caution, but I, I, I do think it's important. I think there has to be a consistent jurisprudence in the court. Now, when I was at the ICTY, there was, I think, for many years, but I have to be frank with you, of late there's been a divergence both inside the court, between that court and the Sierra Leone court on a very important point, which is the rules of liability for the highest uh, criminal, alleged criminal perpetrators. And I think that particular, I hope the ICC doesn't go that route. I mean, it doesn't get detoured along those uh, lines. I hope that it can keep its jurisprudence consistent um, and fair. The other thing that has bothered me a little bit about the international courts, uh, and I'm not sure how it works in the ICC, is, and it's, it's been dealt with in American courts, is the powers of assignment to cases and panels and appeals and trial courts. It was, was a problem even in my time. There's always, there's always a question, how come this one got this one, and how come that one got that one, and that one just filed a dissent, so why is that one now sitting on the trial court instead of the appeals court? So the power, which has been, I think, fairly heavy in the chief judges of these courts, I think that's something that might be looked at. I think the notion of it not being a question of who gets on the panel and the chief judge decides who gets on the panel. We all know if X, Y, Z gets on the panel, it's going to go one way rather than the other. I think those are, those are important points um, that I would put out. The other, of course, my last point is how to help. I think that for the ICC, complementarity has got to work. If complementarity doesn't work, then I think the ICC is in trouble uh, because it can only do six or seven trials. Even, even if it does everything it should and things fall into place, it can only do six or seven trials a year. And there are just a lot, lot more um, perpetrators of atrocities, et cetera. And I think the whole business of complementarity is something the U.S could really help because I don't think even the Servicemen's Protection Act would prevent us from giving aid through our development and other things to the countries, to the countries themselves who are attempting to upgrade their judicial systems so that they can conduct these trials and uh, they won't have to go to the, um, to the ICC. So I think that particular area and the big problem there is going to be how these countries, most of whom, in all honesty, do not have a long tradition of independent judiciaries, how you are going to bring the judges up to uh, the standard of international justice. And so the last point I make, and Hans would know, and uh, Richard, uh, a court will eventually rise or fall on the caliber of the judges. That's my opinion. And I think the efforts have been made by, uh, we were sort of John the Baptist, a, a group of us a few summers ago in evaluating ICC candidates only by what the statute itself 
says they should be in terms of their experience in criminal uh, cases. Um, and now the ASP itself, the governing body of the ICC, has taken that over. It's going to file its first report. We're all very hopeful because my experience in the ICT1 was it was interesting. I could tell a lot of funny stories, which I won't because I'm running out of time, um, you know, about what happens if you put into a trial court in the most complex case cases, a judge who has never been in a courtroom before. He may have been a brilliant, uh, a brilliant bureaucrat, a brilliant professor, uh, but it, you know, it just doesn't work. Now, I am even beginning to think this is heresy and it's not in the statutes. That also applies to some of the appeals courts because I think sometimes the appeals courts, and there's been tension, there's tension in the ICTY and there may be tension in the ICC, appeals judges do not always understand how important the structure is between a trial court and an appeal court and the relationship. I know it's something the U.S. Learned, has learned over 200 years of jurisprudence exactly you know, what kind of lens an appeal court looks at what the trial court has done so that it's fair, but yet it doesn't disrupt the whole system. There is a tendency of people who are not familiar with the way court system operates to look at something and say, well, I wouldn't have done it that way, or, you know, I mean, those facts, I would have come out a different way. That disrupts the entire system, makes the trial judges, you know, kind of what are we here for, uh, and also means you, you can have this inconsistency, which I think is a real problem. I'm sorry I didn't get to everything, but I've talked too long already. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Patricia. <laughs> our, our first panelist has done a great job in outlining the steps that the U.S. has taken to support the national justice, uh, outlining the differences between the ICC and the UN tribunals, and also providing uh, very positive recommendations. Um, I would like to move to the second panelist, Ambassador Stephen Rupp, who is the U.S. Ambassador at Large for All Crimes, uh, heading the UN Office of Global Justice in the U.S. State Department since 2009. He served in the Special Court for Sierra Leone, and prior to that, he served as a senior trial attorney and chief of prosecutions at the Rwandan Tribunal. Uh, Ambassador Stephen Rupp will, given that he's just come back from Rwanda, uh, would like you at least to share with us your assessment of the role of international criminal justice in helping to ensure the promise of never again and ensuring that states live up to their responsibility to protect. Then you could talk about the new engagement of U.S. administration with the ICC and how this has strengthened the cooperation between the U.S. and the ICC. Then the importance of the UN Security Council in providing strong cooperation, uh, supportive language in the UN resolutions and UN cooperation agreement with the ICC. And then how Genocide Prevention Task Force reinforces the role of the Rome Statute system in preventing and addressing mass atrocity crimes. And how the US government may do more to assist the ICC re-evaluating the Kenya cases, including helping more robustly with the protection of witnesses to support victims and putting some political and uh, diplomatic support in the Kenyan government, to under, not to undermine the ICC proceedings. And then lastly, the relationship between the organization of American states, the ICC, and the US role in this regard. So if you may uh, address some of those areas. <laughs> okay. Well, well, thank you very much, St uh, Stephen. And it's, it's a great honor to, to be here uh, uh, with, with uh, Judge uh, Wald and, and, and to see so many friends uh, in the audience, many of whom I often meet with to talk about these, these very subjects. Uh, uh, but let me um, and, uh, just uh, approach this uh, from the point of view of, of, of the job that I have. Uh, the current job, which I've been in for four and a half years. Uh, it was called the Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues. It was changed by Secretary Clinton to be the Office of, of Global Criminal Justice in, in January of 2012. I'm an Ambassador at Large, which uh, uh, those kind of positions don't exist in many governments, and, and many people scratch their heads. They think the only times they ever hear of people at large, it's, it's fugitives uh, that we're talking about. And, uh, and to some extent, I, I feel a little like that. I'm, I'm an individual that's, that's always on the run uh, because of the law. And I uh, just came back a few hours ago this morning, uh, after dawn uh, in the morning uh, from, from the Central African Republic, uh, 
Uh, and at the end of a, of a 10 day trip, which included the stop in Rwanda uh, the following day in, in Burundi, and then, uh, and then yesterday in, in the Central African Republic. And, and uh, the, those last three stops, I was joining the, the U.S. presidential delegation, which, which was led by Ambassador Samantha Power that we were talking about earlier. Uh, before that, however, I was on other uh, visits uh, uh, in, in, in Europe uh, and in the Middle East uh, and, and, and in Africa. Uh, I travel about 220 days a year, and uh, it's uh, <clears throat> been at this job about four and a half years, and I think it's the next trip when I'll finally cross the 1,000 days uh, on, on the road, uh, sort, of a, sort of milestone. Uh, what's, what's, what's this all about? Why, why does the United States have a position like this? And, and what is the kind of policy that we're pursuing uh, through, through this office and, 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 and through our entire, entire government? Um, I should note that the position was established uh, in 1997 at the time of the, uh, uh, of the, the, the international ad hoc tribunals that, that, that Judge Wall talked about for the, for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda had been established. And it was important uh, for those courts to have our support. Uh, initially, it was possible to send uh, people uh, there on detail to, to begin the work of the courts. But fundamentally, these courts needed uh, cooperation of states if they were going to make arrests. They needed uh, uh, cooperation and assistance of states if they were going to be able to collect uh, uh, their evidence uh, and have witnesses, whether for the prosecution uh, or for the defense. And we recognize that. And, and I don't know most of you know uh, Ambassador David Sheffer, who was the first person uh, in that role. And, and the position continued uh, during the Bush administration uh, with uh, Pierre Prosper and, and, and Clint Williamson. Uh, and, and you know, during, the, during this whole period of time, during this period of the last 17 years, we've seen a, a tremendous uh, transition in international justice and, and, and to some extent in, in terms of its impact uh, on our world and on our diplomacy, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's something that wasn't there beforehand. It's probably one of the most profound changes in, in the international system. Uh, you know, since these courts were established, we have, you know, Milosevic uh, brought to trial, uh, uh, John Kambanda, Prime Minister of a, of a, of a government uh, convicted of, of genocide, Charles Taylor uh, convicted at the Special Court for Sierra Leone, where I was Chief Prosecutor. And, and everywhere in the world you go, uh, people have the expectation that if, if these horrible crimes are committed, uh, people will be brought to justice, should be brought to justice. And, and of course, uh, this has happened, this, these expectations have, have been raised at the time that these, these international criminal courts, uh, tri tribunals that were established by the United Nations, particularly the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals, which uh, over time had a budget which uh, I think aggregates now to between three and four billion dollars. Uh, these were enormous institutions in, in which uh, uh, there were uh, 18 judges uh, serving either um, in, in, as ad litem judges or regular judges in each, uh, uh, plus uh, uh, seven judges or more on appeal, at least 40 judges uh, actively engaged in, in, in deciding uh, cases. Now these courts are, are closed, uh, fundamentally. I mean, there are certain trials that are still continuing at the ICTY. Uh, all of the trials of the persons that have been arrested have been concluded at the ICTR. Uh, there are appeals that are, that are still uh, being processed uh, for both, and, and we have a residual mechanism that, that's dealing with these, uh, uh, with these issues uh, of, of follow-up. Uh, but at the time that uh, these courts have had this enormous impact, but now we have a, a really, to some extent, a contraction of the kind of international capacity uh, that, that we had before. And, and for uh, a court uh, at the level of, of, of international court, not a hybrid court, the, the court we have is, is, is the ICC, uh, which of course has jurisdiction, uh, as, as everyone knows, over the crimes committed uh, on the territory of, of its state parties. I think it's 123 now. Uh, and uh, or by the print by the nationals of those state parties, plus the possibility of, of, of having referrals from the Security Council. That's happened twice. Uh, at the same time, though, we've got continuing demands for justice, and, and how are we going to fulfill those? And, uh, and my my travel itinerary invo involves that, and, and a lot of it is uh, is is engaged with this uh, business of uh, of helping the ICC uh, as we can uh, under our law, and, and as I think uh, Judge Wall began to discuss, uh, uh, we do have provisions of our law passed in both bills in 2001 and 2002. 2001, we had 
had a law passed that said that we cannot fund the ICC. 2002, we had the famous law, the American Servicemen's Service Members Protection Act, uh, which uh, uh, people, um, at least in Europe, sometimes call the Invade the Hague Bill because it, uh, it did literally authorize the President of the United States uh, to take action to free any American or, or any uh, allied uh, individual uh, who was uh, being uh, unfairly uh, taken into custody by the International uh, Criminal Court. However, that, uh, that second law had a provision in it that allowed the United States uh, to assist on a case-by-case -case basis and mentioned some potential people who could be uh, before an international criminal court, but not, not just those individuals, uh, uh, any individual uh, accused of uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity or genocide, the United States can assist. And, and reading these two laws together, uh, we determined that it was possible to, to assist the, the ICC on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, but without direct financial support, uh, with in-kind support. And so beginning in 2009, we engaged uh, uh, with the ICC, participated, uh, as we have since November of 2009, actively in the, in the Assembly of States Parties and in the 2010 Review Conference as an observer, uh, and, uh, and uh, engaging in, in every way we can to, to make it clear that we're prepared uh, to assist uh, the, the success of the court uh, on those cases that, uh, we, that are consistent with our values and that, we, that, that are important for, for sending the, the, the message that we sent by the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tri Tribunal, that if, uh, if a horrible crime is, is committed, uh, uh, genocide, serious war crime, crime against humanity, there will be consequences. There will be, uh, there will be justice, and, uh, and that the ICC is, is, uh, is a court of last resort. We prefer justice at the national level. We prefer it closest to the victim, closest to the affected community. Uh, if there's an absence of capacity, we want to get in there and try to provide that capacity. If there's an absence of will, we want to get in there and apply some pressure and, 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 and maybe get the will to have a process. And, and, and consistent with will is the, is, is the independence uh, of the will that, that, that I think most of us refer to judicially, which is the will to, to prosecute and to judge without fear or favor, um, not just uh, the victors, not just the regime in power, but, uh, but uh, an ability to, to deal fairly with, uh, with, uh, with crimes no matter who committed them. If we've got a problem with those two issues and we can't overcome them, then you need, a, you need another place. And, and, and we've determined in these cases that the ICC has taken on, there wasn't any genuine justice going on uh, in those countries when the cases came that way. And of course, most of them uh, came from the countries themselves that acknowledged that they weren't able to deal with the case and they, they, they actually self-referred the cases to the ICC. All of this is part of this business of, of, of you know, sending that message of, of never again uh, in, in the way that I think most of us are familiar with in a, in a criminal justice system in, in our own country, understanding that, that serious crime will continue to, uh, to be committed uh, uh, in, in any society. Um, as, as, as unless there's a fundamental change in the human heart and, and, and the human makeup, but that through an effective system of justice, uh, through police that can uh, find the, the, the evidence and, and, and through a, a process of evaluating that evidence and, and bringing it to trial if it's, if it's strong enough and then uh, having, having it tested uh, uh, with, with, a, with particularly a vigorous defense and, and, and then a determination made about guilt on, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, that if you have a system like that, you can send a signal that if these crimes are committed, there are going to be consequences, and where you can't stop all of them, uh, that that promise, that threat, is is I think what prevents life from being nasty, brutish, and short, as as uh, as, as Hobbes described uh, the, the state of nature uh, without uh, a sovereign able to do those kinds of things. And of course, in these conflict zones, uh, where the state institutions are broken down, and when you often have powerful individuals associated with the state itself or with, with armed groups, uh, there, there traditionally haven't been consequences. As, uh, you know, Stalin famously said, you know, when, when one person is killed, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a crime, when 100,000 are killed, it's a, st a statistic, you know? And, and we've had these historic cases where, where individuals uh, have committed uh, mass murder, and, 
uh, have died in their and died in their beds or or have been allowed a, a safe and comfortable uh, exile with, without any consequences. Uh, sending the signal that that's not going to be the future, uh, that there will be consequences, can't guarantee it's going to happen every time, can, in my view, begin to, uh, uh, to, uh, to deter some of these crimes. Increasing that risk, not that there won't be individuals who want to go all in and commit the crimes no matter what, and, but, uh, but I see this uh, criminal justice and, and the process as, as fundamental to this, uh, to this issue of, of genocide prevention and, and, and atrocity uh, prevention. And it's one of the reasons that, that I engage as, as I do. I mean, I'm, yesterday in the, in the Central African Republic, we met uh, with uh, President, interim President uh, Samba Panza, met with, uh, with the survivors. Uh, women uh, whose, whose, whose husbands and children have been killed in front of their eyes, uh, Muslim victims who've been killed by, by the anti balaka uh, uh, Christian victims who've been killed by, by, by elements of the Salaika, uh, describing horrendous things that are, on, that are ongoing there that we're, we, we hope to be taking effective action with, uh, with, with peacekeeping. We're supporting a, a, an African Union mission there, supporting our French allies, and today passing a resolution in the Security Council to to transition into a, into a UN uh, uh, full-fledged peacekeeping mission with political office and, and rule of law and, and, and police assistance and, and other things, but it's an enormous challenge there. One of the few things that's, that's, that's on the ground at the moment uh, is, is a commission of inquiry established by the United Nations uh, under Bernard Muna, the former deputy prosecutor of the ICTR, I met with, with them and they're working to gather the evidence and really focusing on whether we have organized violence. I mean, some of the violence is, is, is people reacting to, to things that have happened to their ethnic group by taking it out on others on a more individual basis, but there appears to be some, some substantial organized aspects of this, and of course it all started uh, as part of a contest uh, of power, and, and the ethnic part of it, which hadn't, the other, I should say the sectarian part of it, hadn't, hadn't been something that had been traditional in that country, but during the course of the last year, it has become the fault line. Uh, we've got 29 miles. We had 29 mosques in Bangui, 23 of them are now destroyed, 80% uh, of the Muslim population has, has been run out of Bangui, the others are, are living in, in, in profound fear. Uh, comparable situations on, on the other side of the sectarian divide exist in, in other places in, in the country. We've got this commission of inquiry. We also have, I'm really pleased uh, that Fatou Ben Souda is here, and, and she and I have talked about this, and I met last, uh, well, on the 1st of April with her team uh, to discuss uh, their deployment uh, to the CAR on a preliminary examination by the ICC and uh, uh, determining whether cases could be brought there and if there are people that are behind the violence of the anti-Balaka uh, and, and the Selika uh, that are really in enabling uh, this uh, to continue, uh, we want to see those people prosecuted and, and frankly at this point the system isn't strong enough. Then, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say not strong enough, the, the judicial system is, is, is fundamentally destroyed. I met also yesterday with, with magistrates, uh, President Samba Panza told us that she had signed a, a, a proposal, actually it was offered by the Federación Internacional de Guadalajara uh, for the establishment of a special cell uh, to investigate serious cases in the national system. And I met uh, the people that would be involved in that. In that. This is complementarity, of course. But you know, how to provide them with the security uh, to be able to do their work to provide them with police uh, who will get paid and, and will be protected as well to, to investigate, uh, defense lawyers to defend, uh, judges who are safe, detention facilities where people will be, uh, won't be escaping, uh, et cetera. Uh, but that's, uh, that's uh, <coughs> fortunately in the, in the UN resolution today, it's, it will be possible on a temporary basis for the, for the UN peacekeeping force to assist on arrests and on other things in order to, to establish this at the national level. I mean, it, if we can get this right, I mean, part of the reason that, that Samantha and I were there is coming two days after Rwanda is that I, I don't think the situations are comparable. I mean, there's some, there's some similarities, but we don't want another Rwanda. And so having uh, 
uh, uh, pushing hard for these, these criminal justice consequences, ICC, special cell, et cetera, are, are a fundamental part of, of, of preventing the kind of horror that we, that we had uh, uh, in, in Rwanda. I mean, uh, during the course of my travels, I mean, there were other stops uh, uh, in, in Rwanda, obviously, for the moving ceremonies, uh, uh, commemorating the, the, the genocide, meeting with the survivors of, of genocide, but also a, a great opportunity to meet with people involved in these issues and, and uh, to meet again with the director or the, the, the Secretary General Special Representative at uh, heading peacekeeping in the Congo and the DRC, where we're working uh, with him with our rewards program to, 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 to arrest one of the ICC fugitives, uh, Sylvester Mubuchimura. Uh, we, we had uh, included Bosco and Degondo in our rewards program last year. We included Sylvester as well. They were on opposite sides of the conflict between the armed groups in the East. Uh, won't get into all of the dynamics that caused Bosco to come to our, uh, come to our embassy, uh, but the fact that we were seeking him uh, was an important part of that, and, and we were proud that we were able to, with the assistance of, you know, the, of our Dutch colleague, and I had lunch with the Dutch ambassador, by the way, and I appreciate the, 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 the Kingdom of the Netherlands sponsoring today's event, but uh, the, the Netherlands and the United Kingdom were extremely, uh, were our partners uh, uh, during that week uh, a year ago when Bosco came to our embassy and making sure that he arrived uh, at, at, uh, at The Hague uh, uh, four and a half days after he um, turned himself into our, um, in, into our embassy. We also want to get Sylvester Mutuchimura, the leader of the FDLR, the, the group most often associated with the remnant of the, uh, of the, of the uh, forces uh, of the Force Armée uh, Rwandais and the, and the Antara Hamwe that were involved in the, in the genocide in, in, in 1994. And, um, talked about uh, that operation as well as ways that we are working to strengthen the justice system in the Congo. We're supporting mobile courts there. Uh, uh, when I was uh, in the Congo two months ago, I was at the trial of those involved in the rapes at Manova. Uh, the closing arguments uh, on that, in that trial happened a couple days ago. We'll soon have the verdict uh, involving 39 soldiers alleged to have been responsible for, uh, for the rapes. Uh, uh, the challenge that I think a lot of us see is that uh, those are relatively low-level individuals. The case is, uh, uh, is not that strong against most of the, of, of the defendants, and, uh, and there hasn't been, uh, beyond the ICC cases, uh, cases that have taken on mid-level and high-level individuals, and that's one of the reasons why we're pushing for uh, the establishment of mixed chambers uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, consistent with the idea of complementarity. Uh, this, this idea that I talked about earlier, which is you want to, inc if you've got issues of capacity, and there are serious ones of capacity, you've got questions of, of independence and will, one of the ways to do that is to inject international personnel uh, working side by side uh, with, their, with their national colleagues uh, to help impart the skills and then provide the resources and, and the independence. And as we've seen in other situations, uh, that, um, uh, that, that, that international presence could be temporary, as, as it was in Bosnia, where we did uh, something, something similar. So uh, we're, uh, the bill for the establishment of these chambers has now been uh, approved by the National Law Commission and is before the uh, Council of Ministers this week. Uh, I understand that it should clear them this week, and we're hoping that together with the implementation law for the Statute of Rome in the, in the civilian justice system, because not everything is going to be handled in these mixed chambers, uh, that this will be considered and adopted in the current parliamentary session between now and June 15th, and then the international community will need to engage and assist in, in, in making sure that we can do what needs to be done. Uh, to, to really finally have an impact on the mid and high level persons that are, in, in my view, uh, and according to the evidence, responsible for, uh, for the continuation of the armed conflict, which has taken such a horrible toll on the civilian population with murder and rape and mutilation and, 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 and a situation which has uh, destroyed uh, uh, so much of the, of, the, of the hopes of the people, of the, particularly the Kivus. Um, Additionally, uh, during the course of travel, I was in uh, Uganda, 
uh, during this trip uh, where we're uh, working two different ways. One, we've got obviously our operation, uh, which, uh, which was recently augmented uh, uh, to assist regional militaries in, in, in uh, seeking to bring an end to the threat uh, posed by Joseph Kony and the Lord's Resistance Army and, and to bring Kony and those indicted uh, by the, the ICC to justice. We put them on the rewards list. Uh, each of those three surviving fugitives uh, is on the rewards list uh, with a potential uh, reward of $5 million. And of course, we also have now uh, authorized 270 U.S. service persons uh, uh, assisting the regional militaries uh, uh, in, uh, in a, a constant effort which has uh, dramatically degraded uh, the effect of, of, the, uh, of the LRA in, in those areas where the LRA had moved to after it left Uganda in, in the eastern CAR, northern DRC, and in, uh, and in uh, uh, southern South Sudan. Uh, there's still some attacks, but uh, but the number of, of deaths, the, the number of, of kidnappings, the number of, 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 of rapes is dramatically reduced since our operation has been going on. And we hope soon we'll have a good word that, that the Coney has uh, uh, been brought in and, and that the threat uh, has, has, has been eliminated. Uh, at the same time, the, the, they have a system at the national level for trying uh, people, uh, an international crimes division with some people on it that uh, had worked at the tribunals. Uh, and. Uh, they're finally going to have a decision, or they're finally going to have a decision within the next month or two upon the Coelho case, whether that case can be prosecuted. Uh, it was argued in the Supreme Court uh, about a month ago. They have at least another couple cases of, of relatively high level LRA individuals that aren't sought by the ICC that could be tried at the national level. So this is something that we want to see as, as well. So in each of these places, we're, we're trying to, uh, uh, we're working with, with international international uh, courts uh, uh, in, 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 in these specific ones, uh, the ICC, to, to, to ensure that there is a, a justice for the high-level individuals where there's no prospect of obtaining a, a independent justice at the national level, uh, but also working to strengthen uh, the national level. Hoping, uh, consistent with the idea of my office, which is a global criminal justice, that we can, you know, create over time a, a global system uh, that, uh, whether it's at the international level or at the national one, uh, will really substantially increase the risk that, that persons who uh, have committed these crimes will, uh, will face consequences. The, um, let me just uh, uh, go on and deal briefly with, with, with the other, with the issues that, that you dealt with uh, or you raised uh, in regard to the Security Council. Uh, of course, the, as, I, as I indicated, the Security Council has twice referred to, uh, situations uh, to the ICC, Darfur in 2005, Libya in, in February of 2011. The February 2011 uh, referral had a unanimous vote of 15 to 0, and the United States uh, uh, supported it. Um, the, one of the issues that's been raised is if there are further referrals, and, and we know uh, it's extremely difficult because I'm, in some of the cases, such as Syria, that people talk about the, the prospect of a Russian veto is, uh, is, 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 I think, almost a certainty. Uh, but uh, how will the Security Council work with the ICC? How will the U.S. work with it? And this is a, a subject which, uh, uh, which we're, we're, we're working on. Uh, it's, it's a challenging one given, given our law and policy. Uh, as if those that have dealt with um, with these cases of Libya and, uh, and, and and Darfur, Sudan specifically, will know that the text of, of the Security Council resolutions 1593 and, and 1970, respectively, uh, said that the UN will not fund these particular investigations, and and that certainly raises concerns on the part of the ICC, which says, well, you guys funded the ICTR and the ICTY, why don't you fund the ICC? when you send the ICC in to do these kinds of cases. And of course, we have this prohibition in our law that prohibits us from funding uh, the ICC. Um, the, uh, there is a provision in the law that says that, uh, that welcome, or excuse me, in these resolutions, that welcomes voluntary contributions as opposed to payment through, through UN uh, direct assessments. Uh, but because of our law, we haven't been able to make those kind of contributions. We could potentially do things uh, in kind, but um, that's, uh, that's something that I think uh, should be looked at uh, we're in, in 
terms, there have been several proposals in Congress, uh, one of which passed the, uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, la or Senate uh, uh, Appropriations Committee last year by 17 to 12. Whether they would resolve this problem or not is a matter of, uh, of worthy of study, but, but obviously if, if Congress were to want the ICC to be effective in a situation like, a, like a Syria, it'd be useful to, be, to have authority uh, uh, to be able to contribute uh, to, to that uh, to that effort, and, and that's something that I think needs to be uh, needs to be looked at by the Appropriations Committee. And I think, knowing our friends in the ABA that are pushing uh, some of these issues, uh, we, we'd like to see the, uh, some greater flexibility. On the other hand. We also want to make sure that we can continue to engage as, as we have, uh, that we don't end up with less uh, rather than rather than more. The the question of um, of Kenya and witnesses, uh, I, I won't go and get into detail uh, on, on the Kenya case, uh, and, and I know there are a lot of false accusations running around about about. Uh, um, you know, attempts by, by states to recruit witnesses and, and, and that kind of thing. Our, our interest always in Kenya is to make sure that the individuals who witnessed these events and were needed for justice at the international and national level for, as prosecution or for the defense would be protected. And uh, we've spent a lot of effort on trying to strengthen the national system. We've had other efforts to, uh, to train and assist members of or civil society groups that have been engaged in witness protection efforts. Uh, it, um, it is a real challenge. And as, as, as you know, the ICC, as you may know, the ICC uh, uh, has, has had some difficulty negotiating agreements in Africa for relocation of witnesses uh, through their program. I, there was a particular African country that I was hopeful would sign. I don't think they've yet signed. So they don't have formal agreements yet to relocate any of their witnesses in Africa. Of course, then to the extent that you relocate witnesses thousands of miles away, you have greater costs. And of course, you always have the argument uh, that the defense would make uh, you know, the witness to just testifying because of this sweet relocation, et cetera. So you, know, you want to try to find a way to, uh, uh, to, to protect the witness appropriately. And, and the best way to do that uh, would be to, to you know, relocate them in country if that is too great a threat. Uh, to relocate them um, in, in, in a similar country uh, in, in a situation uh, that uh, where, they're, where they're not better off but, but not worse off uh, than, uh, than someone that did not come forward. Anyway, those are, uh, I mean, I, I think we can focus on some of the other issues during the discussion, and I don't want to take up all the time because I know there are a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of questions. But uh, um, uh, Judge Wall talked about, uh, about Nuremberg. Uh, uh, and, and the speeches of Justice Jackson, uh, on particularly his opening address, his closing address, was also a great one. And, and those of us that are Americans that are engaged in, in international justice, uh, uh, eight and a half years uh, as a prosecutor in, in, in Rwanda and in, and in Sierra Leone, and then uh, uh, working with international justice on behalf of the United States government, uh, uh, constantly are put in mind of of the leadership that, that our country has, uh, the leading role that we played uh, from the beginning. And, uh, and I urge anyone who hasn't done so to, to, to read again uh, uh, Jackson's uh, uh, opening address uh, uh, at, at, at Nuremberg, which has the famous uh, um, quotation that you mentioned about if we if we, we don't give these men a fair trial, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, poison the poison chalice that, uh, that we'll, you know, have to be willing to raise that to our lips as well. But, but, but the thing that, that moved me the most in, in the speech was, was, was the great line about the, the common sense of man, man, of mankind requires that the law should not stop with the punishment of, of petty crimes by little people, but must reach men who possess themselves of, of great power. And, and make deliberate and concerted use of that power to set in motion uh, evils uh, which touch every home. And, uh, and certainly in, in the CAR and uh, the LRA affected areas of, uh, of, of Central Africa, in, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the continuing uh, uh, violence and, and rape and murder in the, in the Eastern DRC and, 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 and elsewhere, uh, powerful 
and I think are behind uh, efforts to, uh, that, are, that, are, that are touching uh, the homes, the bodies, uh, the children, the, the, the whole uh, structure of life, and, uh, and, and providing justice in those situations uh, uh, is, is as, as, as President Obama said, uh, not just a, a moral imperative, but, but, but having justice is also a stabilizing factor. It's something that would prevent uh, uh, the, that kind of thing from occurring. Can I do one quick question yes. before the discussion opens? Um, are you optimistic that the complementarity is going in the efforts you, you've just is going to work in conjunction with the ICC so that we can keep along this path and it's it's going to come out all right? Because there are there are people who are not optimistic, but you're right on the scene, so I'm. Well, I I, I think. For a long time, there was a lot of lip service to complementarity, and, and it, sound, it sounds good, you know, do it at the national level. And, and, and frankly, when you get down to it, you say, well, how much is really being done at the national level to focus on these kinds of crimes? Now, all of the development agencies, our USAID, uh, the Development Commission of, of, of the EU, and, and other bilateral donors, uh, focus on, on the rule of law and on strengthening the justice system in various places in the world. And, and, and that can, in the end, uh, uh, sort of indirectly benefit complementarity. But those of us that have dealt with these kind of cases know that um, they have some similarities maybe to organized crime cases, uh, but they, they really require <laughs> Uh, a whole different level of, of, of effort uh, when you're dealing with mass graves, uh, when you're dealing with, uh, with, with crimes committed on an ethnic or, or sectarian basis in which uh, uh, people will, will support you or, 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 or fight you depending on who you're, who you're prosecuting. When, when the individuals who are responsible or powerful, when they uh, control the security services or, or, or some part of it, when there are armed men and groups that can come in and, and attack. Uh, uh, when people can interfere uh, with prosecution witnesses and also because they don't want to see the defense prevail, they can, they can interfere with defense witnesses. Strengthening all of those things <laughs> is, is, is not easy. And obviously, it's something, the DRC is the one place where a lot of us have spent some effort there with things like the mobile courts uh, and, and the mixed chambers is another step. Uh, Uganda with their international crimes division, but then it had this decision that essentially said that the amnesty applied to the individual that they were charged and that's been held up, held up their work for the last three and a half years. We'd like to, you know, get, get those efforts going. But, uh, but I do think that in the wake of some of the discussions that have occurred in the ICC uh, uh, annual uh, Assembly of States Parties and at the review conference, there's a greater appreciation of what's going to be necessary to, to enable complementarity, recognizing, of course, the ICC, and we're not paying the dues, but the dues paying members say, look, well, this is not a development agency. We've got to pay judges. We've got to do all these things. We can't, we, we can't be down there doing this thing, too. But at the same time, uh, we, need, uh, we need to be able to, uh, 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 to, to bring together the development community uh, from both state parties and non-state parties and look at ways that we can coordinate and focus our assistance uh, in support of complementarity. And, and those efforts, I think, are, 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 are beginning. Uh, do keep in mind that, I mean, I, I sometimes make the comment that, you know, you have to judge complementarity on a curve. Uh, a lot of us would prefer that everything be flat in the world, <laughs> that justice be the same everywhere. Sometimes if you can get some military justice going, if you can get some, some people that are, that are abusing their authority prosecuted, that's a positive thing. It begins the process. Uh, and so uh, you, you, don't get, you don't get a perfect system on, on, on day one. But, uh, but, the, but you begin by building it uh, in, in, in certain ways. And, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and so I think there, there's hope. Uh, and, and there really needs to be uh, uh, the effort in this area if we're going to fulfill the promise uh, and the expectations that we've raised. Okay, um, I thank you, Ambassador Stephen Rapp. Let's join Ambassador Stephen Rapp in thanking for discussion um, right now. And then I would like to open up the floor for questions. We have about, um, about 15 minutes. Um, so I'll take the first round of questions. It will be about five questions, and we'll have got the next round of questions. 
John. Yeah. Uh, my question is directed to Judge Wall. One of the problems I had trying to get my mind around how to conduct trials, international criminal trials, there's a conflict, that, in, internal conflict that I see between the Napoleonic or French civil system versus the American British common law system. That, that it just seems to me that there's just an inherent conflict. And as a result, uh, you get judges who don't understand things uh, from one form or another. And I'd just like for you to comment on, on what I have seen as being a fundamental problem with international trials. OK. Um, certainly, they are, there are two different systems. However, and I go back to my own experience, there are certain, I would say, the majority of things that come up in the trial are actually sort of common to both systems. Uh, and I'd be interested in Steve's, I keep saying Steve, Ambassador Rapp's, <laughs> Ambassador Rapp's no uh, experience. Like, for instance, let me just point, when I was there, it was predominantly an adversary system because the U.S. had had a great deal to do with the writing of the original rules. But already I was beginning to see, while I was there, a much greater infusion. And, and I was actually sat on the Rules Committee with Judge May while I was there. And I began to, uh, the Rules Committee, the, actually the whole court passed on the rules with proposals and that, that sort of thing. Um, and it, this, I would say the biggest difference, and it was beginning, it's evolving. Just as you say, the whole global system is evolving. So it's the trial system, I think, to some degree. Although the ICC does have its own rules. One, one interesting difference, of course, is the ICC, the overall rules have to be passed upon by the ASP, by the Association of uh, State Parties. Whereas in the ICTY, the court made its own rules. And every time we had a difficult uh, trial, the rules got changed. Or something. They got changed about 30 times in the first 10 years. Uh, not arbitrarily, but just that something came up. The, the two most basic things that I ran into in that were one which turned out not to be that much of a problem, and that was that a prosecutor could appeal an acquittal. Um, and I, I think it's happened once or twice, but it just hasn't come up uh, a great deal. That was different. The biggest thing to me was the difference in emphasis on oral and written testimony. We do have an adversary system which uh, predominantly oral testimony. I know we have a hearsay rule which has got lots of exceptions, but basically the notion is there that the testimony ought to be oral testimony. It can be done by deposition with a judge in charge, or it can be done by video, we use that. But it's basically a kind of an oral testimony. That began to get less and less, and as I was leaving there, uh, for instance, uh, you could get most of the testimony in a written form, and then it would be subject to cross-examination uh, uh, on, on, on the basis of something. There. I don't think it's, I don't think that it, that, that, that the difference between the two systems is so fundamental that you can't have a fair trial. But I think it is something which has got to be uh, you know, thought out, and each step you take in a particular direction, I think you have to think about. There are lots of little differences, like you could have the defendant in the ICTY's rules, you could have the defendant testify without being sworn and without being cross-examined, like making like a statement, uh, as it were, and that actually happened in one of our trials. But I found the judges took that with a certain, uh, they, they looked at it through a different lens than they would have looked through it if they'd actually taken it. Um, so I, uh, I don't think that is overwhelmingly, uh, it makes it impossible to have a fair trial. But I think it is something that has to be watched. I watch with some, some worry, uh, you know, the increasing emphasis upon written testimony as opposed to oral testimony. I, and I might just add, I remember uh, having gone through these trials, uh, uh, sitting one, at one conference with Jeffrey Nice, who was the leader in the, in the Milosevic case, and, and both he and I were musing, wouldn't, it, wouldn't maybe a civil approach be better 
for what we were doing because when you deal with these massive events uh, that unfold over the course of three or four years, if you're talking about the leaders as opposed to somebody involved in a single massacre, it's, it's a monstrous task to bring in all of these witnesses to tell, you're going to tell everything through oral testimony and, and the, at least the concept of a civil, uh, of a civil dossier where you would have a, uh, an impartial investigation advised by both prosecution and defense that could sort of build a, a dossier of, of, of facts that weren't fundamentally in dispute and focus your, your trial on, on really going after the witnesses and dealing with the witnesses that, that really know the, uh, uh, that, are, that are really pertinent to the, to, the, to the really important issues, which are usually the linkage issues. Uh, the problem with uh, that is that when, when we've had more civil law approaches as we've had in Cambodia, as we all yeah, had in, in, in Lebanon, they don't end up being yeah, like that. that. <laughs> and, and that, that system uh, doesn't, uh, to a large extent, uh, doesn't work that way. And of course, we also re re recognize that, just as Justice Jackson eventually recognized it at Nuremberg, he wanted to do the case largely by documents. But you really do need to have human beings uh, in, in front of the court. And there is an expectation uh, on the part of victims and communities that they're going to hear what, what happened in these places. So you, it, it, there, there has to be, I think, a, a fair amount of that. But I think all of us are, are, are searching for a fair way uh, that we could uh, uh, approach these, these trials so that uh, things that weren't fundamentally in dispute could be uh, established with writings and, and, and then you could uh, uh, deal with, uh, with, in, with, the, with the battle over what's really yeah, important. Yeah, I honestly felt I was only in a couple of trials, but they were year-long trials and hundreds of witnesses. I honestly felt at the end, and despite the other two judges who sat with me were from civil systems, um, I honestly felt that the end result of the trial was fair. I mean, I, it didn't necessarily mean everything that I thought. If I were trying it all by myself, I would run. But I honestly didn't feel there'd been a fundamental kind of, you know, deprivation. Of, of um, can we have the next set of questions, please? If you could introduce yourself and uh, direct the question to one of the two panelists. Thank you to the panel for a very interesting um, conversation. My name is Tasha Manarangin. I'm an attorney at Sidley Austin here in DC. Um, I wanted to ask Ambassador Rapp if you could speak a bit about your um, experience in Sri Lanka specifically and the prospects for justice that you see um, for Sri Lanka. I know you visited the island multiple times and you visited, in fact, the so-called no-fire zones where tens of thousands of Tamil civilians were killed by the Sri Lanka army, and I wanted to see if you could speak to the reaction you received when visiting Sri Lanka, um, since I know it wasn't exactly warm and welcoming, and how you see that sort of playing out in terms of the prospects for um, true accountability on the island when there is that sort of hostility on the ground to international justice efforts. Um, and if you see the likelihood of Sri Lanka ever appearing on the ICC docket. I, did we, I'm, I'm glad to talk about that and, and try to, to do it briefly. Maybe uh, two or three other questions and then we could, uh, and then I, I could speak to that and others could speak to other things. Mm -hmm. Microphone. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm Don Kraus with GlobalSolutions.org, and uh, Judge Walt, Ambassador Rapp, thank you for everything you've done on behalf of global justice. My question is this. There, there is and seems to be within the U.S. Congress a war against international law, uh, which limits exactly how much we can move forward, not only in terms of ratification of the ICC and many other treaties, but also being able to address some of the concerns that Ambassador Rapp uh, said or talked about earlier in terms of not being able to fund, et cetera. Hopefully we'll be able to have some movement on that. But in terms of the legacy of the Obama administration um, and, and the court, 
we are still in a position where the U.S. has never uh, undone the the, uh, the the Bush unsigning of the court. Um, there is not a clear, formalized policy on the court. There is a collection of different statements and documents. From, from your perspective, what should the legacy of this administration be as it as it, in its final years, um, moving on to another administration, and to be able to leave a good foundation and a framework? for continued relationship with the court. I'll take another question. I did the back. <coughs> um, Paula Gordon, I have a, um, I'm an educator and a writer. I would like to ask about the abrogation of international treaties, what, what you feel about that, um, specifically the abrogation of the drug laws as a, a result of the uh, sanctioning of the legalization of marijuana in the states of uh, Colorado and Washington. What is the ripple effect of that, do you think, uh, internationally? that one, Steve, I don't know. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. one more and then we'll finish. Yeah. One last. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Jen Jenanigam. Um, I'm an NGO, Tamils Against Genocide. So just to follow up on Tasha's question, I wanted to make it more general. Do you have any thoughts, Ambassador Radbon? What do you do when you know perpetrators are powerful and still in office, um, and especially with the, the comments made by Judge Wald in terms of complementarity, um, and also could you comment on what the avenues are when uh, a state party is not a signatory to the Rome Statute? You know, what, how would you look at that sort of situation? Well, let, let, me, let me dive into the, to the Sri Lanka issue, and, and of course Sri Lanka, as people have noted, is not a, a signatory of the ICC, not a state party. Uh, and, uh, and it's generally presumed that if there were an effort to, to take a, a Sri Lankan case to the ICC, to the Security Council, there would be a very powerful country that would veto that, to China specifically. And, uh, and there we're looking at a, at a situation where um, in the absence of, of, of international justice, what, what can you do? And, and, and what we've pushed for uh, is, first of all, the, the right thing happened at the national level and, and, and through all our diplomatic efforts uh, uh, encouraged uh, uh, independent investigations of, of those events that resulted in, in the deaths of thousands of individuals. And of course, there were violations on, on, on both sides. Uh, uh, the, the LTT in, almost invented uh, the use of suicide bombing and, and, uh, and was uh, heavy into using child soldiers. And, and, and obviously, uh, uh, there were horrible crimes that were being committed by them. And, and then the, the allegations, uh, uh, which have been found credible, of, of, uh, of, of attacks uh, targeting uh, civilians uh, and, and targeting people that were outside of combat during the, uh, particularly during the closing phases of, of, of the war that ended in May of 2009. In the absence of, of there being any kind of independent investigation, we pressed for uh, resolutions uh, in, this, in the Human Rights Council twice. Uh, uh, asking that that be done and, uh, and noting that failure. Uh, and then uh, when we still didn't have, in our view, uh, uh, those kind of investigations, uh, uh, we pushed, uh, uh, sponsored with, with other countries, a resolution that was adopted by the uh, Human Rights Council uh, at the end of March, uh, which will provide for, for an international investigation under the auspices of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, and can deal uh, with uh, violations of, of uh, human rights and, and, and related crimes uh, uh, committed by, by both sides uh, during this conflict, as well as, as, as other human rights issues that have arisen since 2009. We, we're looking for, for that report to, to, to be, we, we hope, a game changer. Uh, we certainly encourage the Sri Lankan government and, and other uh, uh, and, and, and judiciary to be, to be working to do uh, this work at the national level. A at the end, uh, if we're going to have action, it's going to take, it's going to take that work at the national level. And, and those of us internationally uh, can 
do what we can uh, to bring pressures uh, to, to this, to, 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 in the hope that, that this can be accomplished. Uh, I understand in my, my visits there, uh, there were people that were, uh, you know, had demonstrators with signs that called me a threat to world peace and that pictured me as a devil. Uh, on the other hand, I had a very welcoming uh, a, a visit to with, with, with many people uh, uh, throughout the island and, and particularly in the north and, and understand uh, uh, we want this country to, to reconcile and we, we don't want a situation where 15, 20 years from now uh, people are, are viewed Doing uh, Prabhakar and the leader of the LTTE is some kind of hero for the crimes, and despite the crimes that he committed. And, and the best way to, that, to do that is, is, is to have the facts established, to talk about you know, who are the missing and, and, and what happened to them, and, uh, and, and begin, uh, uh, begin the process of, of, of accountability and, 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 and on that basis uh, achieve uh, um, reconciliation. It's a continuing process, and it's not always easy everywhere in the, in, in the world, but, but the, because of what's happened in these international institutions, the expectation is there. And, and even where we don't have an international criminal court, we've got an HR <laughs> Human Rights Council, we've got others that are working on documenting. You, you may have seen the Documentation Center uh, work that was, was published in, in late February uh, that have documented abuses. Uh, there are other things that can be done uh, for the day uh, when, when justice can be possible. Uh, on some of my visits, I'm, I'm dealing with, you know, obviously with Cambodia and, and uh, there's other places in the world where, where horrible crimes have happened in the past uh, uh, in, in decades ago. And we're working in those countries, even though justice people thought was never possible uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it's now happening. And, and we like to see that because it sends a signal that there will come a day. And, and what we can do now uh, is, is to investigate and to, and to build and, and to obtain the information uh, and the evidence that will be available for the day when, when justice is possible. So it's, there's, not a, there's not a perfect answer right now. It's, uh, it's a world of states, uh, uh, but, uh, but, but there are means to, uh, to keep this issue alive, to establish the truth, and, uh, and I think in the long run, uh, achieve justice. Uh, the, uh, the other question we had on the, um, uh, the United States, and <laughs> I don't know, if, maybe you would like to comment on that. Uh, Which one on, on this is there, there was the issue about the United States and our attitude toward international law. Uh, this is not on the drugs question. Yeah, we I was going to say I don't know anything yeah. about drugs. The United States, okay, I may not have heard that. I, I mean, there was the here issue, uh, you the know, how is it, uh, uh, Don was raising the issue about the United States and the attitude and the difficulty we have ratifying treaties uh, on issues of public international oh. law. I remember once uh, uh, talking with, with Navi Pile, who of course had presided at the media trial where, where, where John Floyd and I were, were consul on opposite sides and is now uh, in, her, in her final months as High Commissioner on, on Human Rights and visiting in her office in the Palais Wilson in Geneva. I noted the difficulty we had in the U.S. of ratifying yeah. human rights yeah. uh, treaties, mentioned the rights of the child, where our own Supreme Court yeah. noted, of course, uh, in the juvenile death penalty case that we're one of only two countries out of, uh, out of all the countries in the world, ourselves in Somalia, that haven't ratified it. And I did hear a report that the Federal Assembly of Somalia was considering ratifying it, so we might, <laughs> we might end up uh, being alone <coughs> uh, with, with, with that one. Uh, I raised that, I, I mentioned that to, 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 um, yeah. uh, to Navi Pile, and, she's, and she was kind enough to say, she said, well, but you Americans protect the rights of the child a whole lot better than a lot of countries that have well, that, ratified. That's always been, I mean, what I... And, and so we do have our own traditions and our own laws and our Bill of Rights and a variety of things that we're very proud of that we think uh, serve these interests, and uh, and it's all one always has a convincing job to do with with the American people and with their representatives that there are values to to multilateral and, and international approaches. Obviously, at the in the in, in the in the 1940s, uh, with the establishment of the United Nations, it came, came to be a strong appreciation of those kind of institutions, and and it's uh, and it may have diminished since, but uh, but it is uh, there are certainly a number of places where we have, uh, in the trade area in particular, where we've understood the importance of these international agreements, and I, and, and I think that it's, it's possible uh, to do it, uh, to, to do it here as well. There's always been a kind of a, a schizophrenic uh, attitude, or at least of late, I think, in the, yeah, uh, you know, the U.S., to, you know, I'll finish up quickly, toward our international um, obligations. My, 
personal reaction, which I found interesting, is that in terms of the issues we've been talking about in the international uh, criminal area, uh, what if, if the media joins in, and if you get sort of a widespread at, at a human <coughs> level, things like Darfur, people got very, that got a lot of publicity, and people got very sort of outraged by what was happening over there, and I think uh, to some degree in Libya, then Congress will kind of, um, will rejoin by actually kind of uh, doing, I mean, allowing something to be done. <coughs> Otherwise, you get a kind of, I think there's a, a general attitude, which may go back to our, some of our uh, you know, forefathers, or some, no, our forefathers are actually more internationalists than we are. Uh, but the notion up there, somebody I remember visiting right after I came back from The Hague, and we had a panel up at, up at the Hill, and somebody, I said something about the, the UN or something, and they said, don't use those words <laughs> here on the Hill. <laughs> UN, that's a bad word. But um, I, I think that there's a kind of a general attitude that you have to permeate. It's interesting when you talk about people, because there are all these, whatever polls are worth, and uh, you know that's certainly a question on its own. But when people ask them, do you think we ought to join the court, or do we? Do? You usually get a you know a heavy um, uh, reaction in the polls saying yes, or I think it's a good idea, sort of thing. Uh, but that does not get reflected back at the uh, congressional level unless there's something that really gets them upset, and then they will say, I, for instance, you know, it would be great if we could get. I don't have any hopes of immediate ratification or anything like that. But if you could get the U.S. service persons act, we won't get that repeal, but if you could get it, if you get, get some more holes in it, if you could get a little bit more flexibility in what you can do inside that, I think it would have a great yeah, deal. Yeah, we're running out of time. Yep. Just, just to follow up on that okay. for, for one minute and, and to, to be responsive to, to, to Don's question and, and concern. I mean, what we, what we did discover as we worked the rewards bill that allowed the ICC rewards to be paid, we eventually, we had to have unanimous seat. We couldn't have any member of Congress that was opposed to it. And we worked through the whole, uh, the whole uh, cha both chambers and, and eventually were able to, to pass that. And it was just in the nature of the way that legislation had to be Considered. Other times you could you could have a decision by a vote, but yeah. but but the point is uh, uh, members of Congress are very concerned about getting, dealing with warlords in, in the DRC and very concerned about the threat of Coney. The Coney thing and, and it's a lot that, of publicity. Yeah, and so to the extent you can talk about the cases, you can talk about the, exactly. the victims and the horrors that are being committed. Yep. You can build uh, uh, the can support build around that, That's right. and people yep. will want to see justice there. And and then uh, uh, through uh, through our engagement and assisting in those cases and bringing in the fugitives and assisting in the ways that we can under our law, we can strengthen our relationship with the ICC and, and, and move uh, toward a day when, when I think people are, are more comfortable uh, with, with the institution. But it'll take, it'll take some time, given, given the, the political lay of the land and, and given the traditions in, in, in the United States. On the drugs question, I'll, I'll duck that one, understand that's fundamentally in the area of my colleague, uh, Ambassador Brownfield, who heads the narcotics and international law enforcement uh, issue, uh, though I know uh, uh, he, he tells me that in various meetings it's been possible to reach uh, an understanding that, that what we're doing in the United States is consistent with our international obligations under narcotics treaties. So, uh, but uh, you'll have to approach him at a, at a coming conference. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.